Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second uh, JAD International webinar uh, on uh, COVID-19 and the skin. I'm Jonathan Cantor. I'm the uh, editor of JAD International, and I want to thank everybody uh, for taking the time to join us. Uh, as with our last uh, webinar on the subject, uh, we have a massive um, outpouring of interest, which has been really gratifying uh, and really is testament to the uh, outstanding panelists that we have uh, today uh, and who joined us last time as well. So hopefully we will be able to at least meet or potentially exceed not only the educational bar, but the entertainment bar that we set at the uh, at the last webinar, which was pretty high. So uh, we're going to see what we can what we can pull off. Uh, I'm joined uh, again uh, by uh, Dr. Freeman uh, from Harvard, Dr. Kovarik from Penn, and Dr. O from Singapore. Uh, and uh, I'm very, very excited about this. We are going to follow the same format as we did last time. So we're going to start with a very brief uh, talk by Dr. Kov uh, by Dr. Freeman that's going to kind of address some, uh, some fundamentals. And then we're going to open things up to questions. And again, the thing to realize is that your questions are not limited only to the subjects that we cover in the talk. Of course, this is really kind of an open panel discussion. Uh, this is sort of a, a, a massive, of course, public health issue. It's a massive issue for dermatologists everywhere. And so anything that we can do to kind of help uh, address questions, misunderstandings, thoughts, comments, uh, areas for future research, that's absolutely fantastic. To do that, you can use the uh, question panel, uh, and I can see somebody has already found that uh, because we have a, a, a greeting um, from a medical doctor in Cambodia, and thank you, hello, thank you for joining us. Um, by the way, the other thing to know is that I don't know who you are uh, if you ask a question. So even though I am not a believer in the saying that there's no such thing as a stupid question, as I tell my kids, the universe of stupid questions vastly exceeds the universe of good questions. But that said, we don't know who's asking what. So you really can kind of get away uh, with the asking anything you like. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about you know whether the, you feel like your question is on point. The other thing to warn you is because we have so many people joining us, I may not be able to get to everyone's question. That is not to impugn the integrity of your question. That is not to suggest that your question belongs in that universe, that vast universe I mentioned of stupid questions at all. It's just that we are limited in how many uh, we're going to be able to address logistically. But again, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Also, uh, I know people who are doing this for CME, there's going to be a code that is shared uh, by the organizers that's kind of not done by our side. And I think that we'll do that towards the end because I know last time some people had asked about that um, early on as well. So we'll make sure that we share that as well. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to pass things on to Dr. Freeman to start with uh, a uh, presentation, and we will go from there. And think about your questions. Feel free to write your questions as you go, by the way, uh, and uh, I will try to get to uh, you know as many of them as possible. And again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is so gratifying. And this is really one of the wonderful things about dermatology, coming together as a community. I mean, we have seen such an amazing outpouring of effort, such an amazing outpouring um, of support. Uh, and it's been really fantastic. And thank you everyone for being um, so, so engaged with this. And uh, with that, I will pass on to Dr. Freeman. Great. And can you just tell me, can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Okay, yes, perfect. Can. All right. Well, welcome everyone. I'm delighted to be back and talking with you today um, regarding our update. And it's hard for me to believe that we are now 18 months into this pandemic. And so what we'd like to just talk about briefly today is give you kind of a little reminder of, of where we've come from. And I think really end with some of the critical questions for today that we are facing um, as a specialty and really as a world. Um, so in terms of where we are today, just to kind of remind you, and this is literally as of last night, um, we are up to um, 195 million confirmed cases of COVID-19. And I think what's really impressive is that we are up to 3.8 billion vaccine doses worldwide. But as we will see, and we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, this is not an equitable distribution of vaccines. So I think last time we talked a little bit about our COVID-19 Dermatology Registry, which is a collaborative effort between the American Academy of Dermatology and the International League of Dermatologic Societies. And what I'd like to do today is to give you a little bit of an update um, about how things have changed. And so I think we mentioned last time that in December of 2020, we added on COVID-19 vaccine skin reactions to the registry. We are now at well over 2,000, almost 3,000 total reports in the AAD and ILDS COVID-19 dermatology registry, which you as a dermatologist can contribute cases to. Um, and we are now at over 800 vaccine reactions and we have data from over 52 different countries. 
Um, so this was our prior publication. And just to remind you about COVID-19, uh, COVID-19 dermatologic manifestations as a whole, that there is a real spectrum of different COVID-19 uh, manifestations from the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself or related to the immune response to the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself. Um, there is a spectrum of this. All the way on the left, we have pernia, which is, goes with relatively mild disease and a really robust um, interferon alpha response to the virus. And over on the right, we have our more severe patients, those patients with retiform purpura with clotting. So this is just to remind you what COVID itself the manifestations can look like, and there's really a large spectrum. What I'd like to focus on today instead, actually before I move on, to just give you a summary of kind of where we've come with this registry. So as I mentioned, over 2,000 submissions, six different continents, and it's really allowed us to have a rapid accumulation of knowledge. And so I've just given you a few um, selection of some of our publications um, that have gone starting with Pernio, moved on to the full spectrum of disease. Um, we've also looked at long COVID in the skin. So indeed, we can have patients with subacute or post-acute COVID sequelae. And most recently, we've started looking at these vaccine reactions. So this is just to give you a sense of some of the publications and the work in this area. And so this is our most recent um, looking at um, cutaneous vaccine reactions reported after Moderna and Pfizer COVID-19 vaccination. And I should say we are not just picking on Moderna and Pfizer. This happened to be most of the data that was entered originally. Um, since that time, we have had cases entered from other countries around the world with other vaccines, um, for example, such as AstraZeneca or Sinopharm. And so I would encourage you, if you're listening to this um, and you are based um, in a non-United States-based location, we would love to hear from you. It's completely de-identified to enter cases into the registry. Um, and we'd love to hear about different vaccines um, and different reactions that you are seeing. Um, so just to give a sense of the different range of vaccine reactions, very much like the infection itself, where we have this real different spectrum of different reactions, with the vaccine, we also see a range of different morphologies. What this graph is showing you, and this is from our paper that was published in the JAD, um, is the timing of different vaccine reactions. So you'll see that top line is the first vaccine dose, um, the second line down is the second vaccine dose, and you'll see that in general, reactions that have happen after the first dose take a little bit longer, and reactions that happen after the second dose happen a little bit faster. Not all reactions are the same. Some of them are a little bit faster, so a local injection site reaction might happen on day one or two, in contrast to a delayed large local reaction, which we often see with the mRNA vaccines, um, which can happen more on day seven or eight. And then we have this group of other reactions, for example, such as urticaria and morbilliform eruptions, which we also see, by the way, in response to SARS-CoV-2 itself. So what we're seeing with some of these vaccine reactions is they're really mimicking the immune response that other people get to the virus itself. And I suspect that there's some of the same pathophysiology and drivers here. So just to give you a sense of this is the kind of the overall timing, the reactions may happen a little bit soon, um, slower with dose one, a little faster with dose two. I would also like to remind you that not everybody who gets a reaction, a skin reaction to dose one, is going to get a skin reaction to dose two. And in fact, less than half of the patients in this study who reacted to dose one reacted to dose two. I think what's also really reassuring about this data is that people tend not, just if you have like a morbilliform eruption to the first um, dose, as long as it's about eight hours, more than eight hours after, six to eight hours after your first dose, the likelihood of developing anaphylaxis to a second dose, which is what people's real worry is, is basically zero. So we can be really reassuring to people that the likelihood if they had a skin reaction, as long as it wasn't urticaria within the first few hours, as long as it wasn't part of an immediate type hypersensitivity reaction, we can really reassure patients um, that we should be comfortable advising that they can proceed with a second dose for vaccines that require a second dose. And I think this is going to come up again when it comes to boosters. Um, and so recently, the BJD published an excellent, I would say, follow-up to this, and this was looking in Spain um, at 405 cases. I think very similar findings um, to our registry-based study um, in terms of the different morphologies. And I really encourage you to look at this. They did a great job, and they have a wonderful supplement with a lot of photographs in it that I think is a great reference. Um, and so here's just some, uh, again, kind of examples of uh, very similar eruptions to what we had noted um, in our JAD piece about um, delayed large local that they're calling COVID arm, urticarial eruptions, morbilliform eruptions. Um, and then we have this group of pityriasis roseolite and papulovesicular eruptions, and then what they're calling purpuric eruptions. So really a wonderful resource, and I encourage you to read that article as well. 
A couple of things that did not come up, I would say, as highlighted in either of the first two articles that I mentioned um, that we've recently published in the JACI of the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology is looking at subepidermal blistering eruptions, um, including bilis, bilis pemphigoid, um, following COVID-19 vaccinations. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And then also we're seeing increasingly reports of pernio after COVID-19 vaccination. And I think this is just one report of several. Um, I think what's important here is realizing that, again, the vaccine reactions are probably really related to people's immune response to the spike, at least in this situation with the vaccine. And so they're really um, copying in some ways the reactions we see to the virus itself. So in some ways it's not particularly surprising. Um, so I think one thing to, to finish up on in terms of data is to think about different collaboration across dermatology in COVID-19. I think it was really inspired by COVID-19 and facilitated in some ways by this terrible epidemic. And so we did start you know, early on um, last year looking at collaboration across dermatology registries. And what I wanted to pull together was a little bit of an update for you to say that there are um, now many different registries. We are actually all collaborating. And I think what really really is a testament to the international collaboration that has come together around COVID is that cumulatively, these registries have collected over 8,000 cases sourced from physicians and patients around the world. And I think this is really an unprecedented level of collaboration across the dermatologic community and one that we really will be continuing. So I think visually you can see how a lot of these different registries uh, are working together. And if you're interested in learning about the collaboration, we have a piece that's just coming out in dermatologic clinics as part of our special edition um, that is currently in the in-press section on their website. So speaking of that, um, we do have uh, a piece that I've edited. I'm very excited about this in dermatologic clinics. We have about, I think, 15 or 16 different articles coming out. Um, and the whole issue is called COVID-19 and the Dermatologist. Um, if you go to the Dermatologic Clinic's website in the articles in press section, you'll see um, a number of different articles that are available right now, um, and they are free. Um, in particular, um, just to highlight one that came out just this past week that's posted by Dr. Fassett from UCSF has a wonderful overview of cutaneous um, COVID-19 looking at immunologic mechanisms of disease. And I know the immunology in this disease is very tricky and so this is a really great review. So I'd like to wrap up by just talking about some urgent issues facing us today. And my subtitle for this is, this is what keeps me up at night. So where are we now? And what I really wanted to look at was vaccines and vaccine administration. I think it doesn't even really take the key at the top of this graph or top of this image to show you that if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, it is a different color than the rest of the world. So this is vaccine administration, COVID-19 vaccine administration. Another way of looking at this is to look at vaccination rates by continent. And you can see doses administered per 100 people we're really falling incredibly short in Africa, Oceania, and Asia, but in particularly in Africa compared to the rest of the world. Another way of looking at this is vaccination rates by country income level. So here, and I should say all these figures are from the New York Times, which does a really nice job with some data visualizations that I like. Um, so the top level there, you can see high income countries, um, the cluster in terms of doses administered per 100 people, upper middle income countries, lower middle income countries and low income countries. And you can really see how this clustering occurs and that we are very not equitable in terms of our vaccine um, administration and accessibility. I think this to me is really an incredibly telling, telling fact. 84% of shots currently in arms worldwide have been administered in high and upper middle income countries and only 0.3% of doses have been administered in low income countries. I think this is our problem and this is something that as a world we are going to be dealing with for the next 20 years. So I think vaccine nationalism really hurts all of us and, and why am I so worried about this? And I'm so worried about this because of variants and that we are really, this is affecting all of us in terms of vaccine accessibility and what this means to all of us. So in terms of where we are today, this is as of last night, our 14 day change worldwide is we are at a 21% increase in COVID-19 cases. So we are heading in the wrong direction and this is even with vaccines existing. And this is really, I think, 
driven primarily, not entirely, but certainly somewhat by the Delta variant. This is data actually from a month ago, because I, I like this particular graph from the um, image from The Economist, but the situation is, I would say, even more is worse now. Um, just looking that Delta really is becoming the dominant strain worldwide, and that this is the fact that we have huge areas that are not vaccinated is really a breeding ground um, for future variants, which will then continue to affect us. So um, with that, I would just like to say thank you to all of my um, co-collaborators and contributors for all of the work I've presented today. And I know I'm, I'm leaving on a, a slightly negative note here, but I just wanted to spark the discussion about some of the key issues for today. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic, uh, as always. Uh, amazingly clear, amazingly concise, uh, and uh, and I would agree. I think the uh, you know it, it's tough because we want to be uh, positive. We want to kind of focus on the the you know the good directions we're going in and how we're all working together. And you know there are some wonderful things coming out of this, as you mentioned, in terms of collaboration, in terms of the rapid publication, in terms of the registry work, in terms of the way the journals have responded by just kind of flexing um, to provide kind of rapid, and reviewers have flexed to provide rapid, uh, outstanding, high quality peer review. But at the same time, the kind of the big picture here that we're thinking about, uh, you know, in terms of why all these things matter is a little bit harrowing. And it is a, a challenge, of course, uh, you know, and that, by the way, is also one of the reasons that I think dermatologists have been doing such a phenomenal and really uh, important job because I think many of us have kind of pivoted from what may typically be in our wheelhouse, what we typically are working on. Uh, I mean, there are some people who this is exactly what they were doing beforehand, but not a lot. And so a lot of people have kind of pivoted um, very um, elegantly uh, to try to kind of really focus on these areas to try to really address the urgent public health need. And I think that's the thing, you know, it's like what I tell my patients all the time, you know, I'm a dermatologist, but I'm a doctor first. That's my kind of primary job. And so it's not just about the skin stuff, it's about every Everything else and about what we can do to advocate for public health and for global health as well. So that was beautifully done, fantastic, and, and thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, a, a question coming. Let me just address that, and then I will uh, see. This is from uh, Hendra in Indonesia. Is there any specific factor that promotes cutaneous reactions after COVID nineteen vaccination? So I, I would say, have you seen any, you know, important associations? Now, again with the caveat, of course, that with a registry study, uh, it is difficult to draw those type of definitive conclusions. But have you seen anything that, you know, we can cue in whether it's primary care doctors asking us these questions, or whether it's nurses who are administering vaccines, whether it's patients themselves, that will suggest, hey, somebody is at risk or somebody's not as much at risk? Yeah, great question. I think, um, and Jonathan, you point out appropriately that the registry in and of itself, because we don't have a denominator, is not great for answering incidence questions. However, I think what's interesting is especially looking more recently at the study coming out of Spain, which I would say, while not totally population-based, was a little bit more systematic because they were looking at all referred cases um, in Spain over a, a amount of time and it had a huge swath of dermatologists involved. I think what's interesting is if you look at the registry data and if you look at the Spain data, um, actually somewhat similar um, in terms of the percentages that we're seeing. So I think it's it's suggestive that we, we may be starting to see some signal, even though I don't like using registry data to do that. But seeing the Spain data made me feel a little better that we were kind of in the right ballpark. I think um, some of the factors that, that come up um, are really related to people's response to vaccine in general. And so they're actually very similar to what we're seeing in terms of if you look at people's spike level um, antibody responses to the vaccines. So we know that younger folks tend to have more robust um, immune systems and tend to respond um, in a different way to vaccines than people that are over the age of 65, for example, or over the age of 80. And so similarly, uh, with a lot of our reactions, we are seeing different reactions cluster in younger folks where they're maybe getting kind of like a big, robust immune vaccine response as compared to our older population. Um, there are some exceptions to that. So if you look at our recent um, bullous pemphigoid study in the JACI, um, there was almost kind of two groups. There was a group that was maybe getting bullous pemphigoid for the first time, potentially triggered by the vaccine that was younger. And then there was an older group where maybe they had bullous pemphigoid brewing, but it hasn't hadn't quite 
you know, come out and the vaccine perhaps pushed them over the edge. And that was an, a much older group of patients. So I think that it's, um, it's a little bit differential depending on which type of, of reaction that you're talking about. I think the other point to, to talk about is um, sex differences. Um, and so we do know that to vaccines in general, um, women some, have different reactions than men. And sometimes women actually have a more robust um, immune response to vaccines than men. And so we are seeing certainly with um, some of these COVID-19 vaccine reactions, such as these delayed large local hypersensitivities, also known as COVID arm, we are seeing many more reports in women than in men. I initially thought that was because healthcare workers were getting vaccinated, maybe they were more female, but as this, the signals have continued to come in, it, it seems to be that that is holding true. Fascinating, fascinating, super helpful. Uh, Dr. Covera, Kara, have you seen, um, you know, anecdotally even um, anything in terms of patients coming in um, in Philadelphia or, or consults that uh, that have been kind of coming through or, or biopsies, which you you know definitely would kind of all come through you. Uh, anything in terms of trends that are uh, that you've kind of noticed that you've been thinking about? Sure. So um, we recently looked at the histologic patterns in the COVID skin reactions. Um, Esther led this effort. And, you know, it's been interesting to look at those patterns because I think sometimes we see what we think might be a COVID vaccine reaction under the microscope, but we might not have that information clinically. Um, the, the clinician might not have suspected that. So I think there's probably more reactions out there than we're actually um, diagnosing. And sometimes we'll go through the chart and actually find out that the patient just had a COVID vaccine. And so I think the biggest thing is sometimes clinicians don't have it on their radar to actually ask, you know, if they see a new rash, think, oh, yeah, you know, people are getting a lot of vaccines right now. When was the COVID vaccine? Because a lot of these nonspecific recent rashes could be a vaccine reaction. And just mention that on the on the pathology rec sheet if you're doing a biopsy, because I'm seeing a lot of these new rashes that I'm like, this could be a vaccine reaction, but if I have no you know, indication that they had a vaccine, I'm not gonna mention that in the report. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's probably more out there than we're actually diagnosing. And to add on to that, I think like, for example, I've had patients now come in with these kind of eczematous or papular or papular vesicular eruptions. And I look at them and I said, hmm, mm -hmm. did you get vaccinated recently? And they're like, how did you know? I'm yeah. Like, the 40th patient I've seen that looks exactly like this. So I think it is important, as you say, if you don't ask, people won't volunteer and it may not to them, you know, it may not to them be related or they may not think about it. And so I think it's a really great, important point to just have it on our radar and to ask about it. Yeah, I think I think we can call this the "don't ask, won't tell" uh, yeah. philosophy. Uh, so, uh, because I think I, I've seen the same thing uh, where uh, you know even people curbsiding me um, about a rash, uh, and I'll say, "Well, have they had a vaccine recently?" And it's sort of like, "Oh, I didn't ask about that." So, <laughs> I think it's the I, I think you're you're absolutely right that uh, you know those of us who you know are working on the clinical side and are seeing patients uh you know i think there is that sort of awareness that okay well this this is a pattern and what this is what we do right it's pattern recognition and so you're like well something's a little fishy whether it's under the microscope or whether it's in person uh you're like this seems somehow familiar to me uh, mm -hmm. so i think that is uh, that is definitely something we've been seeing a lot dr o in in singapore have you been um seeing uh the same the same sort of trend yeah so over here um, we do see patients who develop reactions after vaccine. So over here, majority of our patients receive um, Pfizer vaccination, more than three quarters, and uh, a quarter receive uh, Moderna. And the recent two months, I, we have uh, included um, Sinovac in, a, in our um, availability of vaccines. So there's a range of rashes we see, similar to what Dr. Freeman reported. So we have a range of uh, hypersensitive reactions like angioedema, urticaria, and then we have patients who have flare of their existing dermatosis, for example, mm -hmm. a left eczema or psoriasis after that. I think recently in our center, we've seen two cases of pemphigus uh, vulgaris um, after vaccination. I think one challenge we have is um, how do you blame the, the timeline of the vaccination to the onset of the rash? You know, is it within, do you consider within seven days, within two weeks? We do have patients who develop a normal rash two months after vaccination and they were, and they were quite sure it was due to the vaccination. So 
sometimes in these situations is a little bit tricky to prove causality because sometimes the duration is a little bit too long for the vaccination. Yeah. yeah, that causality point is is key. And for those who are listening and not watching, uh, all the other three of us were all nodding along, as, as Dr. O mentioned, the causality challenge, because, I mean, as Dr. Freeman mentioned, uh, we've got over 3 billion doses, that's billion with a B, doses of vaccine administered in the span of basically six months around the world. So all these people who would anyway be developing their BP or their pemphigus vulgaris or their or their pityriasis rosea, particularly, you know, if you think about the common things like psoriasiform eruption, you know, they may have been getting it if they had been eating a chocolate bar as well. So it's very, very difficult um, to tease out causality. And, you know, that also touches on something that we very, very briefly touched on last time, which is the sort of public health, global health uh, communication responsibility that we have, because we also need to be careful that we are not uh, making uh, mountains out of molehills, particularly with vaccine reactions. Like number one, I think it's absolutely critical for everything to be transparent. So I, you know, personally think that any, I, I understand the intention behind kind of limiting information one way or the other, but I think it's very important if we are, you know, going to have any standing as a scientific community that we make sure that we share everything. But I think we also have to be aware of how that's going to be taken. Uh, and that's why it's so important to qualify things. And it's so important. That's why I think those of us who are involved in this have a responsibility when we are reached out to by the media, et cetera, to clarify things, to make sure that we are contextualizing appropriately. Because otherwise, you know, the last thing you want to say is, you know, that there is this, you know, rash of uh, COVID rashes from vaccines or life-threatening reactions now seen, reported. And the problem is the N of one, the good story N of one, uh, because of the way people learn and because of the way people react to information is always going to be more powerful than all the wonderful graphs in the world and all the wonderful statistics and tables in the world. So I think that's so, so important. Uh, I, couldn't, so thank you I, couldn't, I could not agree more. I think that what you're saying about the media in particular, and I've ended up spending a lot of time with the media in the last few months has been really in how to, if we're presenting this data is you have to think about this to me is actually reassuring. So when I look at the data that we found in the recent study from Spain found that, you know, yes, our patients are getting these rashes, but guess what? You, you may not get it the second time. So please go ahead and do it. You know, and guess what? Probably nothing really bad is going to happen to you, which I think is very reassuring. So it's very important to us to get data out pretty quickly about if you have a reaction with dose one, what does that mean to dose two? And now I have lots of people calling me, if we get boosters, what does that mean? You know, and so I think we're going to continue to collect data and try to get it as quickly as possible. But whenever I talk to the media, I repeat myself like 500 times, my main point being like, this is very reassuring. Please go get vaccinated. You know, yes, these are frustrating. Obviously, it's not fun to get a skin rash. And, and some of them are a little bit more serious than others. But fundamentally, you know, this is a life-threatening disease that you can now have a vaccine for. And the, the risk balance approach to that, you know, it really favors getting vaccinated. And the other thing I tell people from a personal level, and I'm happy to share with this all of you, although I'm sure I'm breaking some sort of HIPAA rule, is that I'm a parent. Both of my children are enrolled in vaccine trials. And so what I tell my patients is, hey, listen, you know, I've been studying vaccine reactions since December 2020, and every day I spend studying vaccine reactions gives me more confidence in the vaccine, not less, to the point that I've literally enrolled my kids um, in vaccine trials. And if you had asked me years ago, would you be enrolling your, you know, five-year-old in a phase one vaccine trial? I would have said you were crazy. <laughs> and yet I did it. Right, oh, that, that, well, that is that. And that is, I mean, anecdotally, that is actually very, very powerful. Um, and uh, no, you are not violating any HIPAA rules. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, you're fine. You're good. Uh, but the, uh, and we have a bunch of questions coming, in which I want to get to. Um, one thing I do want to say before we touch on those questions is, you know, speaking of the media and the way people perceive what we talk about. When we talk, you know, when you were discussing the vaccine reactions, you made the point specifically that a lot of the reactions are echoing or mirroring what we've seen in COVID reactions themselves. And what you're saying, well, maybe it's the the spike, you know, the pathogenicity of the spike protein in the vaccine, and that would kind of make sense. How do you, you know, have you been asked? Have people pressed you on the issue with this, you know, with the talk about concerns regarding pathogenicity of the spike protein? Uh, and whether the, you know, using a potentially pathogenic uh, or allegedly pathogenic, um, you know, epitope essentially uh, as the, uh, you know, in the vaccine, 
how do you handle that when you know one could potentially take the information that we're sharing and saying, hey, listen, you're reacting to the, now. We've all been vaccinated. We love the vaccine, but we, you know, but when people say, well, wait a minute, so maybe it is causing problems. Uh, how do you? How have you kind of addressed that? Uh, because I think that might be questions that we, at least in the U.S., uh, are turning to see more and more. I would say two things. Number one, you're gonna your body's gonna see the spike either way. You're either gonna get infected or you're going to be vaccinated. So that's your choice is that there is not, you're not going to not see the spike. I mean, unless you are living and you're the only person living on a remote island and you see no one, like it's coming for you. And especially with Delta, it's coming for you. So you're going to, your body's going to see it. You have a choice of seeing it in a controlled way or a non-controlled way. I would definitely vote for the controlled way. So that's number one is that this is not a, uh, it's not a choice of like, oh, I'm just not going to be exposed to COVID. You are no matter where you live going to be exposed to COVID. So I think it's important to realize that that's, you know, it's a kind of a different choice. Um, second of all, actually, I'm not convinced it's the spike protein per se. I think that um, what we can measure right now is like someone's antibody response to spike, but I'm not convinced that the spike is necessarily like the antigenic, you know, piece of it. Um, I think it's just, that's what we are able to measure at, at current. Um, another thing I would say is that this is actually positive. If you are, you know, we want you to, we want your immune system to mount the same kind of response that it would if it saw the virus. So the fact that you're having like this nice, robust immune response, I view as, as really kind of a positive thing. Yeah, and I would agree. I think the, you know, the one message that I've kind of given over and over again on this issue is exactly is that there's this, this false dichotomy between you're either getting vaccinated or you're going to live happily ever after. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's exactly, and I'm like, no, the choice is you're being vaccinated, you're going to get COVID. So, you know, your choice is to have a finite dosing of, you know, exposure, which is, by the way, not the virus and cannot replicate, or to potentially have billions of copies circulating in your body and then potentially spread them to other people. So I think that's a that's a key point. Um, any comments on that, um, Carrie? Any thoughts? Uh, mm -hmm. No? Okay. And Dr. O, has that been a, that, that, that hasn't been a big issue in Singapore in terms of people raising these? See, I'm, I'm working in the south of the United States now, in the southeast, where um, a lot of patients, because to me, every patient interaction is an opportunity to provide counseling uh, regarding the pandemic and regarding what to do as well. Uh, and so I'm sort of kind of hearing on the ground um, a lot of the, the things that kind of people are you know, raising their concerns about. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's interesting uh, to kind of see how that all, all plays out. So let me go to some of the questions here. Um, one uh, very uh, uh, astute uh, viewer uh, who remembers our, our conversation last time uh, said that Dr. Freeman mentioned in December that patients with COVID toes, you know, have, and they put this in quotes, by the way. So I'm impressed. Like, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if it's actually a quote. I don't know. Hopefully it's an indirect quote or, or they're taking really good notes. See, I don't know who you are, so I can't give you a shout out. Uh, not a lot of other symptoms. This is all in quotes besides perineal and maybe some fatigue. Is that still valid? Um, and could you expand on that? I was a little worried when you get quoted back to about things you say during a pandemic. I like to, by the way, state for the record, today is what's today? July 29th, because you might be listening to this at another time. And I'm going to say everything that we're saying today is accurate as of today, at this moment. And as of tomorrow, our knowledge could like completely change. So it, I always get a little anxious when someone's quoting me back something that I said earlier in the pandemic, because the only thing we know for sure in this pandemic is that what we know today is not going to be true a month from now. So that's my caveat. So I'm actually relieved because that one still remains true, <laughs> um, is that um, primarily our patients with perineo does seem to be associated with this really robust interferon alpha response. Um, not in particular that I wanna address because some recent studies have looked at IgA levels and said, hey, there's no positive IgA in, in these COVID toe patients. And indeed we don't, and excuse me, IgA IgG. And in feed, indeed, these patients actually don't go on to make IgG. So I would say if you test someone's for IgG and they're negative, that is, that is in fact not a surprise at all. These patients tend to make a very brief IgA response, if anything, and you have to really serially test them over time. And the idea is that they really are having this really robust kind of interferon alpha more immediate type response. Um, so indeed, that does travel with a robust um, and I should say not all COVID toes are you know, from COVID. You could also be walking through the snow barefoot, so keep that in mind. Um, but indeed these patients um, do seem to have a very, you know, tend to have a robust response to the virus um, and in terms of immune response and tend to control it relatively well and don't have a lot of other symptoms. Um, however, one interesting thing that we published this in Lancet um, Infectious Disease is that these patients, some of them are going on to develop long COVID. And so they may have toes for, I have several patients who now have had toes for 12 months, 14 months that started with the virus. We know when they had the virus and their toes have been purple and painful ever since. 
Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is that with the vaccine, I think it's very interesting that we're, I'm suspecting that these patients um, who are vaccinated and get perineo after vaccination similarly are probably having a, a robust response. Great. And uh, Carrie, anything you're seeing from a, uh, you know, a pathology side of things um, that you're seeing or that has changed um, since we last uh, chatted? Um, well, in terms of the pernio, uh, we we have seen pernio vaccine reactions, um, and they look almost identical to the pernia COVID toes of pernio. Um, we also know that you can find the spike protein in the eccrine glands of both um, COVID pernio and vaccine pernio. I mean, it's it's basically a reaction that makes the inflammation go around the eccrine ducts. Um, so it makes sense that if it's the spike protein that you would get it in both the, the disease and in the vaccine. Um, you know, and, and like we mentioned before, you can see similar reactions in the disease and in the vaccine, but the, the pernio makes sense. Um, so. Yeah. And Dr. Oh, you mentioned in your um, your uh, recent report, I think it either just came out or is about to come out in uh, JAD International, um, looking at a, uh, oh, it just came out actually, a worldwide review. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of the low, and you mentioned this last time as well, the kind of the low um, incidence that you've been seeing of these, you know, perineal type lesions um, in Singapore. The last time we talked about that geographically, and we talked about maybe it was temperature related, uh, you know, et cetera. Have you seen any, any differences um, any changes, any update to that? Yeah, it's still, as was before, we have not any seen any cases in this part of the world uh, for COVID rash related, COVID related uh, prognosis or even after vaccination. So it seems to be, yeah, not unique to this part of the world. Yeah. Great, great, great. And uh, uh, by the way, somebody else gave me a PS about a question about uh, long COVID symptoms and uh, brain fog, but I didn't see the first part of that question. So if you want to repost that question, whoever that was, please feel free. Um, another, um, speaking of uh, the, uh, you know, skin long haulers um, article that was, uh, that Esther, that your group published in uh, Lancet Infectious Diseases, somebody was asking about skin manifestations among long haulers in particular um, to watch out for. Uh, and I think what they're maybe thinking about is kind of going from the other direction, right? There's one thing to say, okay, is this skin manifestation itself the long hauler versus how about a patient who's just got long haul COVID in general, anything that you're, you know, more likely to see? Yeah, I think this is a really, um, I think it's a really important point. And I will say I've been working with the World Health Organization in the last few months to really push that they include skin um, in their um, new definitions about what is long COVID. Because right now it's it's a condition in search of a, of a more uniform case definition because we kind of know it exists and there's multiple different pieces in many different organ systems. But I think right now it's not clear you know, what is our definition of what is long COVID. So I am, I am working with the World Health Organization to try to keep skin kind of on their agenda because I think we are important to that. Um, I think two pieces. Number one, um, I would say in some of our long COVID patients who don't have any skin manifestations, so we're really issue dealing with neurologic complications. I haven't necessarily, if they're purely dealing with like neurologic or cardiac complications, that does not necessarily travel with skin manifestations, I would say. Um, in contrast, I have had some patients where they had really skin manifestations after COVID from the get-go, and those manifestations just never resolved. Um, in some patients, that seems to travel with other things. I have some patients who are dealing with kind of the brain fog component, and in some patients, it doesn't. I have several patients who have long COVID with pernio, or they specifically had pernio after um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and pretty much pernio is their only symptom. Um, so I think it's it's not universal. And I really think we need more data. And so this is actually my plea to everyone listening um, to please do enter your cases into the registry. It's www.aad.org um, backslash COVID registry. Um, or if you just search us on a search engine, we should pop up or you can always message me. Um, it takes about four minutes to five minutes to enter a case. It's totally de-identified. And we're really interested in understanding more about long COVID. Um, I myself personally am taking care of a bunch of these patients. I will say another example besides pernio um, is urticaria. We have a number of patients who have had urticaria for a very, very long time um, triggered by COVID. So that's another one just to kind of keep your eyes out for, um, which is a bit tough. Um, in terms of management. So um, please do share your data with us. We would love to hear about the long COVID cases you're seeing. Um, and I think that together we can really try to get more information and data on them. Great. Uh, Carrie, have you seen any differences in terms of the long COVID patients versus the, you know, kind of acute rash patients uh, in terms of, um, you know, from a histology standpoint or from a clinical standpoint? 
I haven't seen many of the long um, haul patients here, really. We've seen mostly just the acute rashes. Got it. And Dr. O, how about in Singapore? Have you seen, have you been seeing much of that? Yeah. Like uh, Dr. Kerry, there's um, not much experience with long haulers over this, this part of the world. Um, most of the time, our, our acute, um, acute uh, patients who tend to have a short course of uh, illness and recover shortly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. So another question we have, it's, which is from uh, Amel in Indonesia, um, is uh, specific um, skin manifestations in neonates uh, or infants uh, with COVID-19 uh, from a clinical standpoint. Any, anyone with any, uh, um, you know, Esther, if we've been seeing that uh, reported and then otherwise uh, clinically, if anyone wants to comment. Yeah, I think uh, two things to say on that. One is that there are some reports and we haven't had a ton of data on this. So I, I'm um, uh, with some reports actually with let me flip it first to talk about for a moment about vaccines, um, is that there were some reports early on with breastfed infants um, whose mothers have been vaccinated um, while they were breastfeeding. And there was some question of whether there may have been some um, somewhat nonspecific eruptions in the infants. Um, I think that's still very much to be determined. Um, the, the end was very small and hard to know because infants get you know other rashes too. But at the same time, we know that these antibodies do cross um, and can be present in breast milk. So I think it's it's possible, it just depends on what the immunogenicity is. So I'd say that's one thought about vaccines. Um, in terms of neonates, um, there was a really interesting study and I apologize for um, not remembering which journal this was in, was whether it was in journal of pediatric derm or not, but um, published by some pediatric dermatologists looking at this um, very purpuric eruption um, on the soles of neonates um, after, after SARS-CoV-2. And, and after this is over, I can try to find the reference for you, but it was really um, an excellently well done um, case of an infant known to have SARS-CoV-2, uh, pretty much a neonate with this very purpuric eruption on the soles of the feet, which I would have missed I because it doesn't look like classic like COVID toes. Um, so I think that's a good one to be aware of. Great, great. Kara, do you know over at CHOP, have they been seeing a lot or sending anything over or? Right now the, the uh... COVID is so low here in Philadelphia. Um, and at the beginning of the, the pandemic, um, I'm not sure if they saw that many um, in the neonates, so. Got it. And, and Dr. Yeah. Oe in Singapore, has that been a? Yeah, so similarly, um, there's not been many reports of uh, neonates or young children being infected with COVID over here. And so reports are scarce regarding what kind of manifestation they mount, but, um, to the local pediatricians, um, those reports have mentioned that suspect cases tend to have mobility form like rashes, like very exempt in a young child. Mm -hmm. Over here, we have not seen any uh, COVID toes in the new nets or young children at, at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm worried too with, with with Delta, just that we are going to be seeing more kids infected. We're already kind of seeing this trend. We're seeing more school transmission. We're seeing mm -hmm. camp transmission here in the U.S. It's summertime. Mm -hmm. People are in camp. And so I do think we are going to start probably seeing some of these cases in, in younger unvaccinated kids. Yeah. And actually, so speaking of uh, and speaking of COVID toast, uh, one of the questions that came up is any consensus on uh, therapeutic approaches uh, that could be uh, considered. Uh, and you can see from the way I'm asking the question and from the way you see everybody, you need to be listening to this, uh, watching this, not just listening it, because you'll see from our facial expressions that you can kind of infer a lot of the directions things are going to go with these uh, these uh, questions. Uh, but go ahead. It looks like Esther, it looks like you were uh, uh, itching to respond to that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of not because I don't have a great answer to this one. I have many of these patients that I'm taking care of personally, and we've been doing, um, you know, pentoxifilin, we've done, been doing calcium channel blockers, we've been doing topical steroids. I've actually tried off-label topical tofacitinib. I mean, I've really tried a lot of different things in these folks. Um, I tried Plaquenil, which did not really have any effect. Um, and my N is small. So these are not, by the way, clinical trial studies. These are like, I have some cases and I'm trying to help them. Um, and I, I've really not come up with you know, a great solution. I end up really treating them topical steroids for flares, potential calcium channel, calcium channel blockers. And I spend a lot of time counseling about temperature because we do know that cold really triggers people. And if we've done one study um, that was published in the BJD that was looking at recurrent perneo in patients who'd never had it before, where it was initially triggered by SARS-CoV-2. And if you look, they have this very seasonal component to them. So when it gets cold, they have flares. And when it gets warm, they do better. Um, and we think if you actually think about perneo in general before COVID, 
it's possible that metropernia was actually triggered by you know, infectious diseases in the past, we just weren't looking for them and didn't know it. And so this whole concept of recurrent pernia in the cold, it's this combination, I think, of temperatures and, um, and you know, inflammation. And so I spent a lot of my time counseling them about temperature, keeping their feet warm, keeping their toes warm, um, and just being really aware about the temperature issue. Right. I mean, if you think about it mechanistically, right, you would probably, I mean, you need a second hit. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. It's like everything else in dermatology, right? Like, why is it there, not somewhere else, or why are you getting it on that toe and not the other toe? Why are you getting it this winter, not last winter? So there's got to be something that is distinguishing. And so whether it's a viral etiology or something else, I, I think that's a that's a great uh, and a critical point um, to, to, uh, to raise on that. Uh, any other therapeutic thoughts, um, uh, Carrie or Dr. O? It's tough because the inflammation is so deep. I mean, when we see these biopsy, you know, it can go deep almost to the subcutaneous tissue and then it's on acral surfaces. And so topicals can be, you know, sometimes don't really work very well. And so I think like Esther said, trying to prevent them before they get bad is probably the best thing. Dr. O, do you agree with that? Yes, yes. And I guess uh, the least you could do is um, counsel on the temperature regulation. I guess the, the coldness tends to aggravate the COVID symptoms, the, the, the prognosis. So I think teaching them, encouraging on a regulated temperature environment might help them at some degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting to think also about the, uh, you know, the, the role of temperature, both in terms of, you know, the distinction between the uh, inception uh, of a perennial lesion and then its persistence, right? So is it that the cold temperature is required just for the inception, uh, but then you can li be living in a sauna, um, you know, for the rest of the time and you'll be, you'll, you'll, uh, uh, which by the way, I don't recommend. Um, so, you know, but I'm not suggesting living in a sauna, um, particularly with COVID. Now, don't go to a public sauna. That's a terrible <laughs> idea. Uh, but um, the, uh, you know, the question though is whether, um, you know, is this just a trigger event or is this something that's required for ongoing, um, ongoing issues? So it's, uh, you know, I think that really also highlights something we've been talking about both in this and in the last um, uh, session that we had, where, you know, a lot of these things are kind of raising fundamental questions about, you know, how we think about pathophysiology, how we address questions, how we think about things epidemiologically, uh, which I think will, you know, hopefully potentially have manifestations and have effects that are far reaching well beyond, um, well beyond COVID now. Um, so somebody asked us, um, Thoughts on the uh, vaccine-related lichen planus. Uh, it looks like they might have had this experience because they said, would you recommend a second dose of an mRNA vaccine in patients who develop lichen planus after their first dose? Uh, uh, you know, with the question of whether that second dose, is the second dose going to exacerbate it or not? Uh, because we don't want, you know, and they're kind of pointing out that LP is something which potentially, depending on how severe it is for the patient, um, can be more debilitating than a lot of other things. So um, how does that affect um, your judgment on the safety of second dose? Well, I, I don't want to sound trite, but I think there is nothing more final than death. Um, and so, you know, if you are looking at, you know, LP certainly can have, have its risks, but in terms of um, being protected from a potentially deadly virus, given that choice, I would, I would definitely choose an LP flare um, over not being protected, especially in the age of the Delta variant where this virus is really coming for patients. Um, so I think, and I, I, I really don't mean that lately or in any way to diminish the experience of suffering, someone suffering, you know, long-term with LP, with lichen planus. Um, but I really think that, um, you know, if the second vaccine were to cause an LP flare, which it very well may, um, it's not going to be causing you to have anaphylaxis, which is really the question in my mind is that like, are you going to die from the second vaccine dose? No, probably not. And your other choice literally is I'm at risk for death if I'm unprotected. So um, to me, that choice would definitely be favoring um, getting a second mRNA vaccine, um, just because the the badness of not getting it, of not getting vaccinated is so high. And I'm not diminishing what it means to live with LP, but I'm just saying the badness of not getting vaccinated is, is really tremendous. Yeah, I agree. Any, uh, any thoughts, um, Carrie or uh, Dr. Rao about that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think everybody has to evaluate, you know, if they have a reaction, whether they get the second dose, but I think probably, you know, an immediate type hypersensitivity anaphylaxis type reaction is probably the only one that would prevent people from getting the second dose, you know, and so 
Um, we've seen a lot of skin reactions and, and people do fine on the second dose. Like uh, Dr. Freeman said, it may be uncomfortable, but um, the life-threatening type of reactions like anaphylaxis, certainly that would preclude you, but the other skin reactions people can typically get through, the flares will go away and they'll do okay. Yeah, and Dr. O, have you seen um, as much of a reticence uh, regarding you know, going for that second shot um, in Singapore? Or do you feel like um, there, you haven't seen as many skin reactions perhaps and or um, you know, people are maybe appreciating a little more the, as kind of what we're trying to convey, which is the value of the, of the shot um, and the you know, relative um, you know, benefit versus the relative risk. Yeah, so uh, as uh, what Dr. Um, Freeman and Dr. Keras mentioned, we do see a variety of rashes here post the first dose. So one way we, we try to help the patients reclassify whether the reaction after the first dose is a uh, you know, type 1 hypersensitive reaction. If it's like an anaphylaxis or you know, the urticaria, then it's surely your risk of a, of a severe event for a second chance is very high. So you might want to consider not having it. But most of the time, the rashes we see here are, um, for example, a, a mild mobiliform rash or a local, local injection reaction, delayed reactions and or exacerbation of eczema and psoriasis over here. So at the end of the day, we do a risk benefits uh, chat to them. You know, the benefits of a vaccination protecting you against a potential deadly virus definitely outweighs the risk of, uh, of a depleting inflammatory condition, for example, like plainness or eczema, which we can actually help you treat through the, the process. If you actually flash up, there are treatment available from the dermatologist. So at the end of the day, if it's not an uh, immediate time one reaction that potentially like anaphylaxis is life-threatening, most patients can safely proceed on the second jab. So that's how we advise over here. Yeah, and, and uh, actually dovetailing on that, we have a question. Oh, go, go ahead, Esther. One, one small point. I'm um, actually really hot off the presses. Um, Dr. Kim Blumenthal, one of my collaborators here at Massachusetts General Hospital, who's an allergist, just published a, a research letter in JAMA um, just a few days ago. Um, so her expertise is in anaphylaxis around vaccines. And so they just published a research letter where they were actually able to give patients who had anaphylaxis and severe immediate type one hypersensitivity to dose one, they were actually able to give them dose two in certain monitored environments. So I wouldn't suggest, you know, going out and having your patients who had a immediate type one hypersensitivity, just like go out and get their vaccine in some random location. But um, I think there actually is a way forward, um, even for patients who had an immediate type hypersensitivity to dose one to be able to get dose two, which is pretty incredible. Yeah, that's great. Although to be clear, that 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 second dose should not be done in a drive-through environment, uh, with you being the driver and putting your shoulder out the window. So, uh, but yeah, no, I think that's that's a critical point, though. Uh, and again, it highlights the importance of what of you know what we're doing. And that's again, I think that's one of those points which I think for us as physicians is sort of intuitive, right? Uh, everything we do, there's a risk benefit to, and we that's sort of how we're trained to think, and we don't even realize that we're thinking that way in the background. And I think what we're seeing now is that communication chasm, not communication gap, between the way doctors think about risk, which is there's always risk, but you're just trying to see what the benefit is potentially, versus the way um, I think the general public may think about risk in some situations, where um, the you know risk of action is always seen as being worse than the risk of inaction uh, on something, even though um, you know your net effect is actually going to be preferable. So I think that's a great point. Um, so uh, we only have a few minutes left. Um, I have a question here from uh, from one of our viewers uh, for Dr. O uh, asking about has misinformation been as much of a problem in Singapore as in the US? And if not, what are the media strategies uh, that are being used in Singapore um, that uh, are obviating that? Is it media strategies? Is it uh, differences culturally? Um, any, any thoughts on that? So just for my understanding, is uh, misinformation a big problem in the US at this point? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Okay. All right. So, so over here, I think uh, a few ways we try to mitigate. Um, and at this juncture, there'll be a lot of, in, in this country, people who are against vaccination. And sometimes they might, um, you know, propagate that, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be um, pushing people to dangerous vaccination with all sorts of reactions that might potentially happen. So one way is um, over here in the media, we try to be as transparent as we can. We will 
highlight the, the daily infected numbers and the daily vaccination numbers we have. And we show that, you know, with the vaccination rates going up, the infection daily rates should co are coming down concurrently. So that's a good sign. And uh, we try to outreach to all medias, um, to everyone as, as radio as available through the papers, to, to the new social media, uh, like Facebook or Instagram. And because primarily this country is also multi ethnicity we have, um, you know, um, Chinese races, ca um, Caucasians, um, uh, Malays and Indians. So language has to be um, uh, tailored to the different languages. So in the media, it will be all languages we broadcasted to make sure they understand. And finally, we also will identify the gaps in this country who are the vulnerable groups. So at this juncture, the elderly are the vulnerable because they seem to get the worst hits with, uh, if they get infected with a high mortality risk. But interestingly, the elderly are also most adverse to getting vaccinations for fear that you know, the vaccination might just drive them to a very severe adverse reaction. So helping this vulnerable group to understand the benefits of getting vaccination is key at this juncture. We can see that the update is coming up with um, regular um, education. I think one key help in this group is the GPs locally because the, 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 the elderly patients here tend to um, have a lot of faith in the local practitioners. So if the GPs can be the propagates, advocates for vaccination, then the elderly are more assured to go ahead with the vaccination. So yeah, so at this juncture, this is how in our little country, how we um, use the media to tell the truth, what is out there and what you will get if you do not get vaccinated and what the <laughs> benefits you get if you get vaccinated, yeah. Yeah. Great, great. And we and we uh, unfortunately we only have a few minutes left because we have a, some really great questions coming in um, that I think are all worth addressing. Uh, but I think one uh, that we probably should uh, make sure we touch on uh, one important question, by the way, which is uh, I, I, if I can paraphrase your question, who, whoever you are questioning, and I'm imagining that you're saying, yes, please go ahead, um, which is that, you know, because they're asking about specific manifestations due to COVID or worsening skin diseases. So I suppose the question is, can skin manifestations be used as a clinical marker um, for uh, disease severity? Uh, let me, if I can just ask very briefly uh, thoughts on that. And then I want to end with one other point that uh, somebody asked about. Yeah, there actually are several good papers um, out there, and I'm forgetting right now off the top of my head if it was in BJD or JAD, um, looking at um, skin rashes as a prognostic indicator. Um, and indeed, I think that the data, and that was, was very suggestive that especially a new onset rash um, can be a prognostic indicator. And we know that some, in many cases, um, the first presenting sign and symptom of COVID-19 can be in skin. So I think as dermatologists, we have to have our antenna up for um, uh, several things. Uh, new rash, you know, definitely put COVID on your mindset. New rash, ask about vaccine. Good to have it on your mindset. And the last thing I'll say is, as a dermatologist, you are in a position of power to talk to your patients about the vaccine um, and to talk to your patients about COVID and they will, you have relationships with these patients and, and they, you know, you can be, you can add to their sense of change and urgency in terms of vaccination. Yeah, and for those who are just listening, the other uh, the three of us were all nodding, uh, especially to that last part uh, as well, because I think that is it's an opportunity we have. We have the the patients are there. We have an existing relationship, uh, and and that's also where you can say, listen, I'll tell you what I would tell, because this is what I tell my patients all the time. I'll tell you what I would tell, you know, my brother or my sister or my wife. It's the same, you know, the same way. Uh, what I'm recommending to them is the same thing I'm going to recommend to you. This isn't sort of a, you know, this is for you and this is, you know, this is for us. This is sort of, you know, and that, because they've got that relationship with you, I think it is that much more powerful. So I think that's a great point. And finally, within our last two minutes, we've got to solve the world's problems here in two minutes, which is uh, touching on what Esther uh, touched on in the end, which is what can we do in dermatology as a field then to address this, you know, disparity in vaccine availability? Because, uh, you know, those of us, uh, and Carrie, you have been involved in this stuff forever as well. Um, I, I think I think Carrie and I spoke at like the AAD, like I think it was, what was it, 12, 14 years ago, we were talking about like global Probably. stuff and what we can do as dermatologists <laughs> and things like that. So what can we do to, you know, address um, this vaccine disparity issue? How do we, um, is there anything we can do? Um, and if so, what are those efficient strategies? And we have one minute to answer that question. So I think that should be plenty. Well, there, there, <laughs> it has to be a, a global systematic uh, strategy where there's one unified um, group that, that puts together an effort like the WHO 
um, and requires the companies to uh, roll this out systematically. I mean, it has to be a massive, massive effort with massive money behind it. Um, one effort, one systematic effort. I mean, one one little group can't do it. Um, so, yeah. And I think there's a, a really nice piece because we're not going to be able to probably, as you say, solve all the world's problems in this short amount of time. I would encourage people to read um, in JAMA. Um, there is a new piece out um, titled Sharing Technology and Vaccine Doses to Address Global Vaccine Inequity and End the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, it's written by Matthew Kavanaugh um, as the first author. So I would really encourage you. I think it's a really nice piece um, that where they argue about global vaccination strategies not working currently and how a new approach needs to be focused potentially on open technology um, shared access. So I think some of these are bigger conversations about open technology and I would encourage you to read that piece. I think is a nice um, potential you know, challenge to all of us. All right. Well, I think we're going to stop there just because of time. I would love to keep going for another like seven hours. Uh, but um, come on, guys, seven, uh, at least six hours, maybe. Uh, poor Dr. O, I don't know what time it is for you right Are now. Are you providing but, uh, snacks? If you're going to provide yeah, snacks. I, 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 yeah, I, I can show, I can draw, I can have my kids draw pictures of snacks and then we can, uh, we can share those. But uh, but again, thank you again. I, I can't thank you enough. The uh, esteemed panelists, uh, I, I hope that people participating understand that you guys are hearing this like from the horse's mouths, um, you know, on all of this stuff. We've got, you know, Dr. Freeman, Dr. Kovarik, Dr. O are just, you know, really the world experts on this stuff. Uh, and uh, so it's wonderful uh, to have you here. I would also say again that just as in dermatology clinics, there are particular, you've got a, you know, dedicated um, COVID um, kind of section uh, for, in the, for the new issue. Um, JAD has had that for a while. So for people who are interested in COVID, if you go to jad.org or jadinternational.org or any of them, it's going to pull from all the journals and it's going to pull the COVID specific articles. So if people are trying to keep abreast of all of that. Um, and there is ridiculously rapid publication times going on here. Um, so things are basically, you know, as soon as they are essentially approved within 24, 48 hours, they're out um, already. So the information is out there. Thank Thank you everybody for joining us. This was a huge amount of fun. Um, and I think, you know, I think hopefully that I'm very, you know, emboldened by the vigor with which not only the panelists, but with those who are asking questions and those who are joining us. So, um, you know, avidly uh, are, are really trying to address this because ultimately it's all about what we can do for our patients, what we can do um, and uh, for public health and what we can do globally. So thank you everyone for joining us and Thanks. take care. And until next time, bye-bye. Thank you. Stay healthy. Thank mm -hmm. you.